Aloha and welcome to this special edition of the Too Close to Call podcast. This is episode 13A, the interview only edition with a fellow Lehigh Mountain Hawk, Mike Ojo. He was a four-year contributor on the men's basketball team at Lehigh, where his junior year, they won the Patriot League and advanced to March Madness, where they were a 16 seed to face the number one overall Kansas Jayhawks. They took Kansas to their limit, ultimately falling short. However, it was such a great experience for Mike, we get into a few of those details. During his time at Lehigh, he also played two years with C.J. McCollum, who is now NBA All-Star of the Portland Trail Blazers. After graduation, Mike decided to continue to pursue his basketball career, where he's played in nine different countries overseas professionally. He started out in Plymouth, England, then went to Cyprus, followed by Sweden, Greece, the Czech Republic, Italy, Austria, back to England, and now currently in Iceland. He actually joins us from Iceland for this interview. So we appreciate Mike taking the time out of his busy schedule to talk to us. He gives us about an hour of his time with some great insight into what it's like playing professionally and what some of these towns are like and ultimately vacation destinations for the rest of us. So as always, we appreciate you listening. Give us a review. Rate us five stars on iTunes. You guys are the best. Coach, we were 5-79 and 79 last year. Why the playoff talk? Well, we made a couple of key trades, and we got the funk. Oh, well, uh, glory be, the funk's on me, Bobby. Keep that funk alive. Keep that funk alive. Well, it's 1975, and I'm like, we'll just be keeping the funk alive. Now joining us on the Too Close to Call podcast is a buddy of mine. We graduated Lehigh University together. He was a four-year contributor for the basketball team, and during one of our years in college, they actually won the Patriot League and advanced on to March Madness, where they faced Kansas as a 16-1 seed. I remember watching that shit on TV, so I can only imagine what the hell it was like in person. And we'll get into uh, a few stories on what it's like going from a small-ass school to uh, you know, being interviewed by the media and things like that. But after graduation, instead of hanging him up like a lot of us do, you know, a.k.a. myself, he just, Ojo, decided to continue to pursue his career and has been professionally overseas for the last seven, eight years now, and almost in six, seven different countries. So plenty of countries, plenty of leagues, man. Very distinguished. I appreciate you joining us, everybody. Welcome, Mike Ojo. <laughs> ah, thank you, man. Thank you for having me, bro. I appreciate it. Hell Fantastic. yeah, man. Hell yeah. So first of all, dude, what's good? It's been a minute since we talked. Man, a whole lot, bro. I've been, I've been bouncing around from country to country. I'm still playing basketball, obviously. Like I'm very fortunate to be in the position. Uh, that I'm in where I can say that I play basketball for a living. <laughs> you um, don't have that nine to five like I do, bro. Man, yeah, I, man. I, don't, I don't, do I don't, don't do it. Don't do it. I don't have it. Some days, honestly, I can't lie to you. Some days I've thought about, you know, hanging it up and, and taking <laughs> no, that route it. of life, but I, I don't know if that's for me at the moment. Hell so. yeah, man. I respect that. I respect that for sure. No, you sound good, man. It sounds like things are working out. Been following you on social media. I know you're joining us from Iceland currently. So our listeners can appreciate the fact that there's a time difference. You're playing ball and you're willing to join us. So once again, man, that's awesome. And some of your pictures over there are crazy. Man, it, honestly, it's it's completely different being in a frozen tundra. Like I never, <laughs> never in my wildest days did I ever imagine that I would end up visiting Iceland, let alone playing basketball in Iceland. Bro, I thought Iceland was green and Greenland was ice. What's the deal? You're telling well, me that's a they, myth? They lied. They lied. Yeah. Let me tell you that right now. They lied, and I realized that was a lie. Like as soon as I like I, I landed here, I've only been here for what like a week and some change, honestly. Okay. And I was living off the same thought, like, oh yeah, Iceland's gonna be green, green than this ice, you know, cool. But the town I'm in is actually four and a half hours outside of Reykjavik. Reykjavik being the capital city, Reykjavik itself was not even green like that. It was all ice and snow it's also winter throughout this four and a half hour drive like i was periodically in and out of consciousness just due to <laughs> jet lag and and all that because coming to iceland from los angeles 
eight hour time difference. So yeah, um, right, exactly. And you bring that up, and that's you know kind of where I wanted to start our initial conversation was you start in L.A. and then you end up in a small school in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The, your first cold experience i can imagine nowhere near iceland but i'm sure it was the first time you probably saw what 10 inches of snow like how yeah, the hell does that was... happen bro how do you go from fucking venice beach santa monica to bethlehem pa it was my first experience with snow period like, <laughs> i thought so point blank period. <laughs> i i was being recruited by honestly by a lot of patriot league schools a lot of ivy league schools also some like west coast conference schools and whatnot but you had the grades coming out of high school then. Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely had the grades. Definitely, definitely did. Because my parents, like, one of their main kind of points of emphasis for me as a person was education, education, education. Sure. And obviously knowing the short-term shelf life of being an athlete, period, like, you obviously have to fall back on something at some point. So that's why I always took my studies seriously to a certain extent. Like I was in college, I could have done, could have done better as everybody could have, but. Oh uh, shit, man. No, I always say Lehigh, me and Lebo and the baseball guys do. We talked about how it literally, it, it prepared us for the real world in a way that it just kicked our ass multiple times, man. Like absolutely. statistics <laughs> class ain't exactly transitioning over, but getting my ass kicked <laughs> and having to bounce back and pass statistics class is, tr- is teaching me something. <laughs> Hey, let me let me tell you about you know what I can't even go into my experience with with statistics and uh, my man <laughs> Ping Shu Wu. He was a he was a great teacher. I didn't really understand him too much, oh, but man. he helped a lot of other people uh, understand the topic of statistics. Well, shit, if you're um, like me, you took I took what calculus twice, statistics twice, I think finance twice. It was like God damn. Man, I was bro, I was I was one and done. Let's put it <laughs> respect, found, man, I, respect. I, I found a way to make it work, and I made it work, and I got the hell out of there. I love um, it. I love it. So, but yeah, man, on uh, the hardwood, no, you end up in in Bethlehem again, kind of. Yeah, how's that so happen? um, Lehigh came like they literally kind of impromptu pulled up on me. Like I was playing at a, a Bob Givens tournament, um, AU. I was playing for Baron Davis's AU team. Okay, there um, it is. I, re- I remember you saying that name and and the connection. So. Yeah, now that's because Baron Baron also went to Crossroads. We went to the same high school. Okay. So excellent. From Crossroads now, like Baron Davis went there. Austin Crozier went there before him. He played for the Pacers for a few years. He was a bit of an NBA journeyman. Then now recently you have Sharif O'Neal who went there. Then went to UCLA. His sure. brother Shakir is there, and obviously uh, LeBron's kids are now there as well. Is that is that so, the school that they're at? Oh man. Yeah, that's. That's the school that they're at. So <laughs> Okay. Um, so this is where you're coming from. All right. So you were at home at Lehigh then, just say it, right? Man. <laughs> unfortunately for me though, things were things were a little bit more difficult um during my time there. Like I ended up in like kind of a transitional stage where uh, the program's original coach was getting ready to retire. So as far as like the recruiting front, things were different. Like he wasn't allowed to necessarily bring in other talented guys so i ended up solo my junior year my senior year and man those are some really dark times from a basketball standpoint because there's nothing worse than putting your time effort heart and soul into something sure and not getting the results that that you want but fortunately like i was playing for a really great au team with some incredibly talented guys and that gave me a platform to kind of get a lot of exposure yeah i was gonna say and, you still ended up d1 man so it turned out all right for you yeah and no, I it, it definitely worked out i know um i ended up playing in a tournament in north carolina it was called the bob gibbons tournament like on my team like i had a dude named chase Stanbeck. he ended up going to ucla deshaun harris went to texas a&m uh darnell gant went to university of washington so i was literally playing with like high major high major yeah that's guys. a squad so the tournament itself was full of like high major guys we played against mike beasley's team God, honestly, countless amounts of like pros. I can't remember all of them. But That's awesome. Long story short, Brent Reed, head coach of Lehigh, he was doctor, an assistant at Doctor, the time. right? Oh, my bad, my bad. <laughs> Dr. I just let remember be that respectful. being a joke on campus. <laughs> yeah, let me be respectful of that man's title because he's a doctor. He uh, he saw me identify my talent, and he went back to the head coach at the time it was Billy Taylor. And next thing I know things started moving really fast. Like, I had, I had some other offers and interests on the table, but Lehigh really made it a point to get me to visit, to come out to visit me, to watch me play. Like, they really made it seem like it was about to be a really good experience. 
And on my visit, I had a really great conversation with a uh, with Coach Taylor, and he kind of told me his vision for me as a player, and he really sold me on that. And I was like, you know what? Like, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And from that point on, obviously, I committed. Um, and just in fact, like on that same visit, like I met one of my best friends in the world to this day, Prentice Small. Like we instantly just connected, and it just it just worked. Like, how is so Prentice doing? Good, What's he up to nowadays? Prentice is doing well, man. He's uh he's coaching now. He's okay, coach. I was gonna say I ran into him at Rackley's wedding last year. Ah, so. okay, 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 okay. You okay. were too bit. You were too busy being a pro ball player and all. Man, the I was actually really upset about that. Like, I was really mad because. I was in Austria at the time playing. I was on second place team, um, and we were about to make a playoff run. And I told Will, like, the only way I'd be remotely okay with missing his wedding, because I was supposed to be, like, in the wedding, right? was if we ended up winning a championship. Unfortunately, we did not win a championship. Son of a so, bitch. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, but, man, uh, it was a good time. We missed you for sure, but... That's great, dude. That's great. And obviously you had some success while you were there. You guys made the big dance, you know, one year. I think, what was that, CJ's freshman year? Obviously he came in and made a difference for you guys. That's continued to this day, obviously, playing in the association now. So take me through your career kind of that way early on. I know your minutes man. and points increased as you went through your career. You were one of those developmental guys, man, putting in the work. I remember you and Taylor – my fat ass is up there getting a sandwich from some versions, <laughs> and you're down there shooting hoops with the gizmo that shoots them right back to you, man. Oh man, my league experience, like it was, it was solid, man. I had to, I had to put in a lot of work to, to prove, honestly, to, to the coach that I was deserving of being on the floor. In some instances, I felt like I had to prove more than others did. Um, but regardless of how that might have played out, at some point, like I, I made, I made breakthroughs, I made impact like plays, I had impact games as well, and it was it was a process. Um, I personally feel like I could have been more of a contributor earlier on in my career, but obviously, coaches are coaches, and they feel different ways about things sometimes. Sure, um, and, and to your credit, man, like I mentioned, you put in the work, and and by junior year, senior year, you were getting quality minutes, putting together quality statistics, and like I mentioned, that was the one year you guys won the league. So take me through that experience, man, winning the league and then traveling man, to winning. Kansas. I'm sure you were right in their backyard, you know, playing a road game, and ultimately you guys gave them the, the blueprint on how to beat the Jayhawks. That was the year Northern Iowa beat them the next round. Yes. So you guys hung around and, you know, it wasn't a blowout. But take me through all that, man. Did you get any goodie bags? Did you get any swag? Like, what was the so, deal? Oh, man, man. To, honestly, to start that season, we knew, like, we knew we had something special because we obviously had a really strong returning core, like Marquise and Zaire, like two all league guys. And then, in addition, we still had Rob Kiefer there. He was freshman player of the year. So, like, we have a really talented group of guys. And then you inject a young, wiry, uh, 6'3". Lanky you know, motherfucker, man. Guard. Yeah, long, <laughs> lanky one who, who was maybe 5'8", five, 5'9", five, at best on his visit. <laughs> and then he rolls up to campus 6'3", looking like a completely different player. Still, still wearing remember. that Browns hat, though. I'll give him credit for yeah. that, man. He rides oh, with yeah. the dog pound. I remember, I remember, like when he first set on, like set foot on campus as a freshman. I thought he was a completely different recruit. I was like, when did we get this guy? Because <laughs> he had obviously grown, but he he was a he was a sensational scorer initially. He was undersized, but then with that additional height, like it, it was <laughs> it was a lethal combination. But um, anyway, we kind of ran through we ran through like our preseason, ran through league play, and fortunately for us, like we managed to to play Lafayette in a home game for the Patriot League Championship, which which is really kind of all you can ask for as a player. Like, to, to be able to play in a rivalry game, to go to the NCAA tournament, like, there's nothing there's nothing better than that. And fortunate for us, we're at home, too. So, Bro, I'm going to interrupt that, you there real quick, but up until, I think, like two or three years ago when they remodeled Taylor Gym, there was a picture of that game at home. And my drunk ass is right there in the front row in the student section under the hoop. And I'm like, yep, I ain't in the Hall of Fame, but I'm right here as we walk it in, baby. Let's go. Oh, man. I remember that. That was a fun game. Bro, it was crazy. And I know we all we all contributed that in that game. Like, you really saw the core of the team. 
like CJ obviously was CJ, Marquise was Marquise, Zaire put in work, I put in work, fortunately Prentice did as well. We honestly, we wanted to draw Duke that year because historically, like if there's an overall number one seed that ends up choking, more often than not, it's Duke. Like that's just how it works. Spoiler um, alert, two years later. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we're going through like selection Sunday thinking like, okay, we're probably going to get a 16 seed, but it's not going to be that bad. We'll have a shot. Maybe we'll get Duke, blah, blah, blah. We end up drawing the number one overall seed of the whole fucking tournament. <laughs> and, of course, this is Kansas. This is Kansas with Sharon Collins, Xavier Henry. Um, Did they have the Morris Cole twins? Aldrich. They had the Morris twins on the bench. You had Thomas Robinson. And I forget who else. There was Brady Morning, sorry, and there was one more guy who touched the league. I think it was Tark Black that was also on that team. Deep, to say the that, least. Exactly. That's the sense of like seven, eight, like NBA guys. Of course, with them being the number one overall seed, like we ended up going to Oklahoma City to play that. Sure. That in its own right was, it was such an experience because the NCAA tournament is, is so important to the country. Like we really were, we were a part of the big dance. And, like, when they say the big dance, like, it really is a big dance. Like, we were getting police escorts everywhere. Like, people were cheering for us when we walked in buildings everywhere. Jeez, that's awesome. It was just, it was an amazing experience. And being, like, being in Nike school, like, they kind of looked out for us. Because, like, we were Nike, but we weren't necessarily, like, Nike elite. So we got, like, <laughs> we got a little bit of gear. We had some really, you know, shaky jerseys. but That level tournament. two swag, right? Yeah. Once we got into the tournament, they threw a little extra gear our way, which was greatly appreciated. And we thought we have to show out as a result of this. And we definitely took Kansas to their limit in about, I want to say, 30 minutes worth of play. The last 10, like their talent kind of wore us down. Yeah, through halftime, I remember it was single digits, even into the second half. And I'm sitting here going, holy shit, man, we're one run away from possibly yeah. stealing this and then like you mentioned uh seven or eight nba guys later it's kind of like pound them pound them pound them and then just the depth like you mentioned i think ultimately it ultimately wore us down but a young cj mccollum ended up dropping 30 put his name on the radar yeah and i i mean he had honestly he secured his his space and his talent just throughout what he's like through what he did had done excuse me during the year but that definitely pushed him over the edge I mean, granted, it wasn't one of his most efficient performances, but he did exactly what he needed to do, and he got buckets. Spanish! Do you trust that we provided you with enough slack so that your block will land safely on the lawn? Sir, yes, sir. And Blue! Yes, sir. Do you trust that I do not want to see you die here tonight? Sir, yes, sir. Blue, you're my boy! Thank you, sir. You're listening to an interview with Mike Ojo that is brought to you by The Ram King. Visit www.theramking.com for all your t-shirt needs. Anyone out there who knows a teacher who's looking for their next t-shirt order in regards to spirit wear, have them reach out to www.theramking.com, the t-shirt king. He's a fair price, has a fast lead time, and even gives you a free design. Visit www.theramking.com, type in Too Close to Call Podcast, where you heard it from, and get yourselves the friends and family discount. Now, back into our interview with Mike Ojo. But if we don't hurry now, we might miss the plane. Of course. How selfish of me. Let's do all the things that you want to do. So ultimately, you guys can't pull it off against Kansas. You fall short. It's your last collegian game of your career. Was there any part of you at that point that thought that may have been your last game or... Did you have something lined up at that point professionally? I guess kind of take me through the transition from graduation, ultimately ending up to uh, Plymouth, England here for two years out of school. Man, 
So it's, it's funny you ask this because first off, that was our junior year when we played Kansas. Oh um, yeah, fuck me, right? You had one more year. Nah, you're, you're, you're fine. You're fine. What, you're right uh, though. You're right. I forgot. What ended up happening, uh, like senior year, we were honestly favorites to win the league because we have <laughs> we had an NBA player on our team. <laughs> Let's be honest. That's fair. That's fair. Like we had an NBA player on our team, and CJ was killing. Like he was he was killing, and all of our role players, myself included, we had all stepped up to shoulder a load. In addition to CJ, Gabe Knudsen started playing really well, holding Griner, um, myself, Prentice Small, freshman Mackie McKnight. Like we were, we were rolling. And unfortunately for us, we ran into uh, Mike Muscala, ironically, and the Bucknell Bison. Yeah, the uh, locals we, here will know that name. We actually just traded his ass to the Clippers for Tobias, and, and he's now a Laker, which is what's really sick. Yeah, he's on the other side of town, right? Just moved into the north yeah. side, now the south side. <laughs> yeah, literally. So yeah, at the end of that game, man, coach threw something up for CJ. It was a decoy play. Ball went through me. I swung it back to CJ. He attacked downhill. Went into Mike Muscala. Mike fouled him. The refs didn't call it. <laughs> You're still begging, bro, nine years later. What's funny, though, is like I talked to Mike two weeks ago, and he admitted to fouling CJ. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you said you were on his foul. podcast. What podcast is he uh, doing? I started working with this website called uh, Close Up 360, and I actually um, i am doing some writing for them. In addition to some podcast stuff, and I'm actually sharing uh, my story like with basketball. I did want and to ask I, on that because I saw that pop up when I was, you know, looking into your name to kind of see what the hell you were doing. So is that like a Players Tribune type so, of thing? Yeah, it's kind of like a Players Tribune type thing where you know you kind of just share your story and share some of the, you know, the ups and downs of basketball. Yeah, it's awesome, experience. man. Like it's really funny that you obviously asked about this because I've been I've been writing about it, and so far I'm at the end of my second season. But anyway, the transition, man, like I honestly, I thought basketball was over for me after that game. Like I loved the game, but I didn't know what the next step was. Like I had spoken to people about playing overseas and stuff before, but I didn't fully look into it. And, you know, it kind of, it kind of was, it was a bit of a mystery to me. I knew if I wanted to do it, I felt like I could stumble into an opportunity. Sure. And Did you head back to LA to kind of start training? Uh, so. So what ended up happening is, like, there were a bunch of agents, actually, that were really interested in representing me, kind of finding a job for me, like, overseas. Like, I ended up actually flying out to Chicago to meet with one agency. That was a pretty fun process. But ultimately, I ended up working with, or decided to work with, a guy who used to go to Lehigh himself. Like, he played there. He was at at Bill Griffin's uh, recommendation. Like, I took him up on it. Hell yeah. And representing Lehigh, baby. Use that exactly, education. Exactly. And uh, from there, you know, things kind of fell into line. And I had a few offers from some different countries, but ultimately I decided to go to England first because I felt like it would be a solid transition. Yeah, you'll have to forgive my lack of knowledge up front, but as we run through your professional career, you'll have to educate the listeners on kind of the the level of competition, upgrade, downgrade in leagues, man, because you've been all over the place, but... Ultimately, Plymouth, England. Have you ever been to England before? And I guess um, is the so, BBL a you know quality competition over there? So here's uh, the, the plot twist. So I, I actually have a I have a British passport um, because my mom is is English. <laughs> That's um, right. Okay. So with that, like there are a whole bunch of different levels and kind of statuses that you can have overseas. So if you're a dual passport holder, uh, like American and any like European Union country you'd be considered a a Bosman A. So as a Bosman A, you don't count as an import because on teams and depending on the league, there's a cap on how many imports you can have on each team. And Um, as a dual passport, you don't count against that. So that's a benefit to yourself, obviously. Exactly. And being an American with American talent – Sure. An American ability. But yeah, I wanted to get in that. Players. You know, speaking English over there, who speaks, who doesn't. Obviously, but, in England, they will. That'll come up a little bit later. But, man, just the whole thing. I'm like, holy shit, I know nothing about this. So, yeah, so I decided to go to England because it would have been like a soft, softer kind of transition to Europe. Being an English-speaking country and honestly being America's, like, father on the low. It was just, <laughs> it was just easy. I decided to go there, and, man, that, like, it was tough. Like the first month was tough adjusting to 
pro-life. Like, I've said, I put in a lot of work in the summer because that's just who I am. Like, I, I'm a workaholic to a certain extent. And I got better. But obviously, playing professionally is completely different than playing at the Division One level, period. Yeah, take me because through a week in the life as a professional. Because obviously, like you said, there's no class, there's no parties. Kind of how it, yeah. how did your day-to-day change? It also still varies to this day to kind of coach and country. But in England, we would have two-a-days pretty much every day. Like, we'd wake up, have to be at the gym to either lift or shoot or something like that from around 9, 9 to about 10 o'clock, then go home, rest up, and we'd be back in the gym at 5. And we'd be practicing, like, full-on practicing from about 5 to 7.30. And that would be depending on game schedule, like maybe three, four times a week. Wow. And with that, obviously, like with no class, like it's, it's, it honestly was low-key like college, but you didn't have class. So you have <laughs> an you know, exponential amount of free time. And I chose, like, especially after my first like week there, where I really felt like I was slightly behind the curve. Like I invested all my time in just going to the gym and working on my game and improving. And I ended up outplaying a lot of like the, the veteran guys who were in my position just because I literally was busting my ass to continue getting better. Sure. That first year was really up and down. Like I had some real like some standout games and then I had some typical rookie games. But on the whole, like the first year was pretty good. Uh, but not good enough for me to get out of England at the time. So uh, fast forward to that summer. Um, I had a bunch of offers. They weren't kind of what I wanted them to be. And it seemed like the best course of action to take was to just go back to England. And now being comfortable in a situation, hoping that I would, you know, thrive. And that second year, I definitely did. Like, I had one of the the best years of, of my professional career. Like, I ended up averaging 23 a game, three rebounds, two assists. I shot, like, 51% from the field, 45 from three. Is there a lot of turnover year to year on the roster? Man, that's the thing. Like, overseas, it's cutthroat as fuck. (laughs) (laughs) If you're not producing, if they don't like you, if the team doesn't win games, regardless of how you perform or what you contribute, they'll say, hey, it's been nice, but we're going to let you walk. Damn. And it it sucks. Like, I, I know that was something that I struggled with my first two years because I felt like we had guys that were really capable. And as just as we started coming together, as a team, the coach coach slash GM would make moves and get rid of guys. So it's almost like you have to start that rebuilding process all over again as far as like team unity, team bonding, all that stuff. So that was tough. But after that year, like there was, man, so much happened that year too. Like I ended up, I got a fracture of the orbital floor of my right eye, oh, fractured my ankle, just a bunch of like random bumps and bruises that – kind of temporarily slowed me down but didn't stop me from achieving my goal which was like ultimately playing well sure how many games a year were you playing over there um in total we ended up playing maybe maybe like 35 40 games that's at least that's what i played like on the year in total it was like 50 or 60 something like that so not quite the 82 of the nba but definitely more than the college season yeah definitely more than the college season yeah no i played i played really well that year and uh, that kind of landed me better opportunities to get out of the, like to get out of England because England on the hierarchy of basketball is not it's not at the top. Okay, let's put it that. Way. But if you put up numbers and show that you can play, people will respect that. Sure. So from England, I ended up going to Cyprus. Um, yeah. Pause with, there. I uh, I sure did have to Google Cyprus to see where the hell that's man. at. So yeah, no Cyprus is it's an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, like right by Greece, Israel, Turkey fucking paradise <laughs> to say the least well like, that's not honestly, what i had envisioned man so damn that changes my outlook bro it it honestly felt like i was playing basketball on vacation <laughs> which can Just be difficult because, like the, the weather was amazing the food was amazing because it's it's basically a mini greece oh. like the culture was amazing like the language barrier actually was an issue here because obviously like i don't speak greek or Cypriot, which is its own like dialect of Greek. Yeah, amazing. But, man, that was that was an experience to say the least. Like, so how do you communicate and, with your teammates or even so, officials? Like, how do you get anything done on the court? I know basketball is a universal language, but that's only to a certain extent. 
so yeah, no, basketball definitely is a universal language, but for the most part, teammates speak English. Okay. If not good English, broken English. So sure. you can kind of communicate. The coach also always speaks English. Okay. And if he doesn't, there'll be a translator who can help. But again, it's broken English and you have to get used to the way they communicate. But <laughs> right. It's like using your spark Cyprus, notes, right? Like putting the rest exa- of the story exactly. together. <laughs> but Cyprus was, it was an experience, man, because like I was saying that England was cutthroat, like England didn't compare to how cutthroat like Cyprus was. Wow. Like Cyprus was cutthroat to the point that we went through, I want to say 18 guys. I was one of two players to make it through the entire season. And what's crazy is we still managed to win like a, a cup championship there. No With way, you won it all. Did you have a parade down Main Street or what? So what's funny is in Cyprus and in Greece too, to a certain extent, sometimes like if a team is losing that's supposed to win, their fans will involve themselves in the game. So the game technically doesn't end. Jesus. And when I say that, I mean they'll they'll riot basically, <laughs> and they'll force the game to be stopped. Yeah, did and you ever your safety? Obviously, did you ever feel at any point that it was in jeopardy? Yes. <laughs> so in this championship <laughs> game, um, we're up. It's the fourth quarter. There may be three minutes left, but we're up a cool like 10, 15 points, something like that, something substantial, and the momentum's on our side. I end up getting to the free throw line. And I'm going through my free throw routine, like I'm shooting. And I shoot the first free throw, like I make it cool. And I'm going through my routine for the second one. And as I go to release the ball, I see something coming at me from the corner of my right eye. Oh, no and shit. Somebody had thrown a flare, <laughs> like a lit flare at that. They threw a lit flare at me at the free throw line. Uh, and you, it's, holy shit. And bro, I took off. I ran into the locker room. And... It's like that flare was like the signal for all hell to break loose because the fans started fighting each other. Like it just became a full scale riot. No way. And, and you guys are chilling like, in the locker room during all this. And we're just chilling in the locker room knowing that we're up. So we're not necessarily tripping, but security at the door or what? Are you guys like getting ready to throw like fight night oh, in the so locker room or what? Security, man? Like Security was an understatement. Like security was at our door. And they ended up using tear gas to disperse, like, the crowd. Oh, my God. So we ended up playing out the last, like, three minutes of the game in an arena that was empty and that had yet to really be ventilated from this tear gas. (laughs) But we ended up, like, we ended up winning, fortunately. But it was was a lot. It was a whole lot, man. That's crazy, bro. So I guess that's why you didn't go back next year or what the fuck took you to Sweden? So with Cyprus, man, like, what's crazy is I I was willing to go back. Like, I also had a good year there, too. And I had had a lot of forward moments in my career. Into that summer, like, I was playing in the the Drew League, which is, like, a pro-am. Honestly, one of the best, like, pro-ams in the country. Do you still play in that or how many times? I still play in it. I still play in it. I went up to try and dunk on somebody, and <laughs> as I went to jump, like, I felt something pop in oh, my shoe. No. And I thought, like, I thought I had blown out, like, one of the air bubbles in my shoe, because that happens sometimes. But in reality, like, I had actually torn ligaments in my big toe, which is the only toe that you need. Like, I had the freak accident, a random case of turf toe on a fucking basketball court. Oh, my God. <laughs> so... So I ended up having to have surgery, being out for about, it was about four and a half, five months. Now, do you fly back and, a, fly back to America for the surgery, no, or how does was, that work was, with the medical staff? This was in, it was in LA that I got hurt, and since I wasn't under contract, everything health-wise was on me, like from an insurance standpoint. Jeez. So, yeah, which wasn't the best, but fortunately, like, Obamacare was still a thing, and I still slid in under my my parents like health care yeah thank, thank God. goodness and, in that scenario uh, right it's that off exactly. the wall shit you don't think about but that's crazy so yeah i went through the whole recovery process from that and the thing like things with any injury is like physically like you'll be fine but it's getting over the mental aspect of things that is it's the toughest part trusting yourself um, again and like i i went through a really rigorous like rehab process and as soon as i got back on court like i just pushed it like just I was just trying to get myself to trust myself again and long story short like it happened and the next job I accepted like I ended up taking an offer to go and play in Sweden and that was my 
first experience with like the cold cold <laughs> and like i thought lehigh cold was was cold being you know centralist pa like it's you have winters sure but sweden was on a whole nother level to say the least hit the negatives out there oh beyond beyond the negatives like there <laughs> i didn't i didn't see a day where there was not snow oh not man so even if the honeys were looking good out there you couldn't see I mean, anything was, bro they were bundled up cool, but everybody everybody was completely bundled up like man <laughs> it was it was a whole lot and in that situation too it was crazy because i ended up getting placed on like the team i was on was in last place and my job was essentially to try and pull them out and and help do so and it's really tough going into kind of losing situations because a lot of the times like the guys are cool the coach is cool but you know the, the team itself just can't find that you know cohesive unit that can win games sure and man it was it was a struggle in addition to the fact that the team they were kind of cheap so road trips were long and brutal like we didn't fly anywhere like we take the train and like the the low light i'd say of the train trips was uh, after losing a game to a team called uh like lulia and lulia so lulia is like at the very top of sweden whereas like where we were in orobru it's like almost near kind of stockholm to a certain extent if i'm getting my geography right don't quote me <laughs> sure. but anyway was that your worst travel professionally i i don't want to oh, spoil hands alert hands later hands but did you fly do you fly a lot of the times or is it bus uh, most like... of the time it's, it's bus but it's not like it's not over crazy distances That's but good. in this instance like we had i want to say like a 15 hour train ride back right after losing and we, we didn't even get to be in like sleeper cars we were in like just chairs for 15 hours <laughs> you were riding coach oh yes with no wi-fi like nothing it was stone age brutal. baby <laughs> it honestly it was one of the the toughest travel experiences i've ever had in my entire life oh um, so that's basically what what uh made you say get me the fuck out of here i'm going to greece or did you get traded that so, year i saw you know so two different the season, teams the season ended there and like i'd strung i strung together like a, a few good games that allowed me to display kind of who I was as a player. And the agent I was working with at the time managed to parlay that to uh, a deal in Greece to finish out their season um, because the Swedish season ended early. And this team was, they were playing in the cup championship out there in Greece. And in Greece, basketball is everything. It's the be-all and end-all of sport. They love it. And I actually was, I was fortunate enough to sign a two-year deal with this team. And the team that we were playing in the cup championship was uh, Panathinaikos, and Panathinaikos is one of the most historic teams in European basketball. And man, they're they're a Euroleague team to put it in perspective. Okay, Euroleague sure. Team, I know that like, name. That's right, there, <laughs> right under the NBA um, from a tier standpoint. So we're playing them in the cup finals at their place, and the atmosphere and everything for that was just it was just crazy. And I never had truly imagined that I'd end up in a situation like that where that would be the stage I'd be playing on overseas. And it was it was an amazing feeling. Like, I didn't necessarily get the most minutes I wanted that game just because that was my first game in. Like, my, <laughs> first, my first game in Greece was playing in the cup championship against Panathinaikos and, like, freaking European legends. Talking um, about giving you time to integrate into the system, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> it's just like, hey, you're here. We're going to throw you right into the fire. And man, it was it was a great experience. Like I got played pretty well. But fast forward through that, as I mentioned before, I said I signed a two-year deal. But with it being Greece, with it being cutthroat, uh, after the season, um, actually, oh, side note, side note. So CJ's brother Eric, yes, uh, played for this team the year before, and the same coach that coached Eric was there to coach me. And that's like a a really kind of funny segue as to how kind of our career paths kind of crossed. Sure, I've seen him on uh, TV. I believe he's won the tournament, the financial yeah, no, tournament. That's a million they, bucks. They I've win, seen him on there. They, they win the basketball tournament every year. Yeah, There's no there point go. in anyone else even playing in it. They sure. win it every single year. <laughs> uh, every year. But no, Greece was it was great. So the end of the season, they end up firing the team president, the head coach, and the GM. Oh, my God. They completely cleaned house. And the downside with that is when you clean house, you clean contracts off the books. Sure. 
And so my two-year deal evaporated, and it was back to the drawing board. Is that a point where you think it may be it? Or, I mean, obviously, dude, a lot no, of ups and I, downs. That's that's crazy, crazy oh, career. yeah, bro. At that point, I wasn't thinking that that was it. I was just, you know, I just charged that to the game. I was like, damn, this sucks. But Part of the I'm business. not going to let this. Yeah, I'm not going to let this set me back. What almost made me step back and say the hell with this is my agent disappearing on me during that time. Because she felt like since I was locked up for the next year, he didn't have to do any work. But then by the time they announced that everything, you know, had been official as far as them firing everybody, it was like July. Right. And I'd missed a couple signing periods. So I was trying to get in contact with him. He was shading me, ducking me, doing what shady European agents do. <laughs> and all the meanwhile, like I started talking to other agents and I was just trying to, you know, trying to get things going. And fortunately for me during this time, like one of my good friends, his name is Ashanti Cook. He went to Georgetown, played over there, and he's now into acting. He, oh, um, nice. He got me into like commercial acting. And every now and again, I would <laughs> whoa, go Whoa, whoa, see, whoa, hold up, hold up. You were in my acting class in college, right? Yes. That's it, baby. <laughs> we got that background. Let's go. That was my only A at Lehigh. The only A. Let's go. <laughs> Bro, what's funny? So what's you used funny, your right? talents and things we learned, Bro, man. That's fucking hysterical. I completely forgot I even took that class. Yeah, let's Bro. go to the roots, man. I would occasionally pop into, you know, auditions or whatever. And there was one day, like, I just was so frustrated with the whole process of playing overseas, my agent not doing anything. Like, I was just like, fuck this. I don't want to do anything anymore. Like, I was just about to go home. And we were at the gym together. And he was like, yo, you should go to this audition, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't want to go. This, that, and the third. And he's like, bro, just go. I ended up listening to him. And long story short, I ended up booking this role. And it's uh, to be in an iPhone commercial with Steph Curry. No way, dude. That's fucking yeah. amazing. And so, like, I booked that, and I'm like, shit. Like, okay, this is, if this is what acting life is like. You know, <laughs> oh, like this is I'm easy. Done. What the fuck are people talking like, about, I just, right? You know, I went on my third audition ever, and I landed a national commercial. Oh, like, my God. Why am I doing anything else? But in reality, obviously, it's nowhere near that simple. But, like, uh, God just gave me the blessing of all so blessings. So what commercial was it, bro? I don't remember so seeing you. A, I feel like I would have remembered uh, for an iPhone 6S. Shit, um, that's I'll awesome. Up, honestly, I'll send you. I'll send you a link for it. Hell yeah, um, I'm gonna put that up there. But it's just, it was just so funny how that all kind of worked out. And then right after that, commercial was booked. Like this, this sketchy agent pops up, and it's like, oh, you thought I forgot about you? That's like a direct quote that I'll never forget in my entire <laughs> life. Like you haven't talked to me in months, and this is what you have the audacity to set to me oh, with. Oh man. And he's like, yeah, I've got a deal for you. It's non-guaranteed. It's in Italy's second league. And if you go over there and play well, like they'll sign you for the rest of the season. I think you should take it. And I'm like, fuck it. Let's do it. So end up going to Italy, playing for a team uh, that's actually in Sicily. Vacation that spot was, there as well, man. That's a totally man, different culture from uh, man, Cyprus. Dude, you're seeing a ton of shit. That was another amazing, amazing place, bro. Like, Italy, the food, the weather, like, man. I respect I you for not putting on weight going around on this tour, bro, man. Man, amazing, 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 amazing. And it was it was a truly good experience. However, like, game one, I'm guarding the ball, and the big, like, hedges, hedges, and then I get screened, and I literally get a freaking, what do you call that, like a stinger on my shoulder. Sure. And this is the first stinger I've ever had in my life. Because I play basketball. I don't play football. <laughs> Never went numb so, all the way down in the fingers and were like, I'll I be good in a minute. I literally could not move my arm. Yeah. But I got fouled, and I had to go to the free throw line. And I went to go through my free throw like my free throw routine. And as I'm going up to shoot, my left arm, which is my guide hand, just doesn't come up with me. Sure. <laughs> and so the first shot, I, like, I, missed, I missed badly. And the second one I managed to make just off the strength of muscle memory. <laughs> and, and I'm like, yo, I need this up. I ended up getting out, like, taken out of the game. And offensively, like, I wasn't doing anything for that game. But I threw together a really solid defensive effort, kind of facilitated. And just, I played pretty well. And we ended up winning that game. What's also great is, like, as I was recovering from that, I was still practicing stuff. And by the time, like, 
I got over this thing, or like I was in a really good flow with the team, playing very well. And then, unfortunately, in practice, like there was a breakaway, and I went to try and strip the ball from one of my teammates, and I caught three of my fingers on my shooting hand in his jersey. Then, after hitting the jersey, they hit the ball. So I ended up hyperextending three fingers and tearing the soft tissue like in my right hand. Oh, so that probably um, swelled up huge. And bro, that's that shit was bad. Like it was it was very bad. And they just told me, oh, you know nothing we can do about it it's not that big of a deal blah 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 but i couldn't dribble i couldn't shoot i couldn't pass so i i read the writing on the wall instantly like i knew i was about to be sent home because i'm I'm here to replace an injured player to begin with and now i've got hurt myself it just doesn't look good and i was really really good friends with the gm of that team like we got really close because he's a very very cool guy and yeah, he told me that he cut me. I'm like, man, like I already know. Like I'm not even upset about it because this kind of is just what it is, you know. It's You've been around luck. a few years at that point. You know what's up. exactly. Like I kind of know what's going on. End up getting sent home once again. Go through like this rehab process. Once I get my hand back together, I end up uh, like I, I was training at this place called Velocity Sports and Performance, and just doing like general strength stuff and. I'd go from there to just the gym to work out. And at this time, Baron was Baron Davis was trying to make um, like an NBA comeback. And yeah, I remember reading about that. Baron being Baron, like I've, I've known Baron at this point since like seventh grade. <laughs> so he was like, man, like Mike, you know, you should come fuck with me in the gym. Like, let's get some, you know, some workouts in, blah, 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 blah. I'm never going to say no to working out with like, you know, a perennial all-star. Hell one of yeah. the you know, like, I'm never going to say no to that. So I had the opportunity to work out with him. Darius Morris, who was also injured at the time, was recovering from a, like, foot and ankle surgery, something like that. And then a few other, like, fringe-level NBA, like, NBA guys. And so I'm coming, obviously coming off injury myself. So, again, there's a mental hurdle that you're trying to get over. But I was getting quality working with NBA-level talent. And I really was kind of coming to my own. Like, I was performing very, very well. And Are you guys playing pickup in like a high school gym, or, or no? So you said at, at this uh, at this workout facility. So we're at we're at uh, we're at UCLA. This is all at all at UCLA. Oh, you're in Pauly, baby. Nice. It's like we're we're no the wood the wooden center, but no, we're we're getting in really good work, and that did wonders for my confidence to say the least. Because if I could get a bucket on NBA guys playing overseas, should be cake. Sure. From there, um, opportunity came that called for me to go to uh, the Czech Republic. This was a similar situation where it was a team that wasn't last place, but they were trying to fight for playoff position. They were just trying to improve their standings, and they brought me in and said, yo, we, we need you to to kind of pull us up. Long story short, like, I ended up doing just that. Like, I played very well. I ended up leading the league in scoring for the period of time I was there. Had I had more games under my belt, it would have, like, officially been the, like, scoring champ of that league. You know, from there, carried that on to a really good summer. I ended up turning down a bunch of offers that, in hindsight, I should have taken. Um, (laughs) That's how life goes sometimes, you know. Live and learn, baby. Oh, you definitely live and you learn. Sometimes you don't learn and you stay stubborn. and (laughs) got to, you know, keep getting slapped with the same lesson. Right. My my wife would probably agree with you on that for sure. Man. Uh, Long story short, I end up in Austria, and I was with a team that was basically in Vienna. And this was one of the craziest situations I've ever been in. Like, because I thought things things were crazy in the Czech Republic. Because I had like a, a Serbian slash like Yugoslavian like coach, and they're very intense, like cool people. But they're very, very, very intense. Like those screamers. That's just how they get down. Dude in the Czech was he was my guy. Like he had the utmost faith and confidence in me. To this day, he's one of the like one of the coaches that had the most belief in me. I'm forever thankful for that. But this dude in Austria, like, they sold me on coming in, like, you're going to start, we're going to do this, that, and the third with you, and you're going to be a stay, like a stable piece of our team. And then when I get there, they try and tell me that, oh, yeah, we're going to need you to play a developmental role for, like, our younger guys and help bring them along this, this, that, and the third for the season. And I was the only American on the team. And I'm like, okay, this doesn't remotely align with what I'm trying to do. Because at this point, like, I'm 26, 27 years old. Like, I'm entering the prime of my career. Like, I'm not trying to take on the veteran role by any means. Right. And we went through about three or four games, and it just wasn't a good fit. And but fortunately to me, like, there was a team that had a 
a guy named Alex Westby, who I played against in Sweden. In Sweden, uh, he was actually on that team in Lulia with that crazy ass train ride. <laughs> like I, I fried them. Like I played really, really well. And so he remembered me when we played them in Austria. And coincidentally, I played really well against them again. <laughs> and we start chopping it up just about the situation that I was in and if I was happy with this and the third. And I'm like, bro, I'm trying to get out of here like ASAP. And he's like, man, let me, you know, let me see if I can help you. Like, let me talk to the people up here because you're the, you're exactly what we need as a team. So the deal was like, okay, like he was going to talk to their GM, their president, all that. And I went and told my agent, like, yo, like I might have a, a link to get to a better team out here. And he also wasn't happy with the way the team was using me because they kind of screwed him over. And long story short, uh, Alice came to me and was like, yeah, like we want you. And so my agent and I wanted to keep it under the table. So we just told the team that I wasn't happy and I was just going to leave. And like I asked them for my release and literally a day later, like I was on a train ride going up to this team in uh, Gmund in Austria, which is like a small small like lakeside town like it honestly was a beautiful beautiful place to say the least if i'm not mistaken i feel like uh unfortunately like i think hitler might have been born there something crazy like that that's one of the things like the the place is known for so are you traveling by yourself from place to place here like is your agent just like yo hit the uh 10 30 from this place to this place there's a ticket Uh, waiting for you yeah no i'm I'm traveling by myself i'm kind of (laughs) just just figuring it all out that's crazy Um, man and like no, the teams are the teams are paying for like the travel and transportation. But yeah, so I ended up going up to this like this team, and it was it was a perfect fit. It was one of the best teams, and one of my best experiences like so far as a player because it was a team full like veteran guys. We all wanted to play the right way, and we all had winning at the the forefront of our minds. And yeah, unfortunately, this is the team I was on that coincided with Will's wedding. No, oh, okay. And Unfortunately, we didn't win the championship, but we made a really good run. And after that, again, like I roll into summer with really good prospects of, you know, things on the horizon for the next season. But me being me, I was really stubborn with wanting to hold out. And I held out a little bit too long. Like I passed the bond. Uh, two really, really good offers that, again, in hindsight, like I really wish I would have taken. One was to go and play uh, in Israel, like Israel's second league. And their second league is really, really good. It feeds into their first league, which is one of the best in the world. In addition to that, there was a team in Finland that played a Champions League and Euro Cup. So had I gone there, like on the year, I would have played maybe like 81 or 82 games. Yeah, that full Uh, slate of games. Exactly. But unfortunately, like I was all the way on board to sign there, but they cut the offer in half like at the last minute because they wanted to squeeze another player in as well. Right. And I couldn't. Like, I couldn't take that. I didn't want to settle for that price. Even though hindsight being 2020, I should have done it. But anyway, so held out, was working out, working out, working out, continuing to get better. And it's now, like, December. And all all the meanwhile, like, too, I have some stuff with the Nigerian national team that's coming about. And so in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, even if I'm not going to end up where I want to end up, uh, like, season-wise, I can still just do that. Yeah, take me through Um, that process, because I know you don't walk on to a Nigerian national team. Man, so I was identified, like, honestly, I I forgot to mention this earlier. Like, uh, coming out of Lehigh, I I had the opportunity to participate in the training camp for, like, for the national team. And that was, we graduated in 2011, and 2011-12, well, excuse me, 2012 was an Olympic year. Um, Ironically, Olympics were in London. And that team was in need of shooters. And I went to that camp, and I I shot the ball very well. Like, I performed, and I I left a a notable impression on some people there. So they kind of kept me in their system, in their loop. And this next time around, um, for the the World Cup of Basketball, which is going to be in China this summer, there are a bunch of qualifying games. And I was identified as the guy that they wanted to bring in and kind of fill out to see if I'd ultimately make that final roster. So once I got everything sorted out as far as, like, passports and stuff like that, it was kind of a waiting game. So while this is going on, I'm still obviously hoping to land somewhere for the season. And I got to the point where I was just like, you know what, I just want to go somewhere and play. And I ended up going back to England, which, in my opinion, was one of the biggest mistakes I could have ever made. But at the time, I was sold on the fact that 
the situation was supposed to be really good. This was a team that was in like third place. They were in the cup final. Like everything was flowing and they just needed another piece. And I was thinking, okay, perfect. Like I'll be that other piece. I'll slide in and help elevate the team and, you know, we'll do what we do. But it just didn't work out that way. I'm not necessarily going to air people out or air the situation out in full, but it just wasn't a good fit. But in the meantime, like I had the opportunity to go and play in Mali with the Nigerian national team, just in the, the qualifiers for the World Cup of Basketball. So I ended up having the chance to play against Mali, Rwanda, and Uganda. Those were the three teams that were in our pool. Um, we ended up winning all three games. I played very well. Um, I had one game that was just uncharacteristically bad, though. Like, I just made some bad decisions, but I ended up rebounding and still performing well. But, yeah, that was a crazy experience because I never envisioned myself in Mali playing basketball. I never envisioned myself in Mali, period. Yeah, I don't even know where the hell that is off the top of my head. So I'm like, you know, holy it's, shit. It's, uh, no, that's like West, West Africa. Okay, so you guys did well there as a team as well? Yeah, no, we did well there as a team. But to have the opportunity to do that, man, like, speechless. To this day, like, it just overwhelms me to do, speak on that. Sure. Are you in line for uh, anything for 2020? Or I'm sure that's, you so, know, yet in the future. But is it a possibility? I, it's definitely a possibility. I'm hoping, honestly, if I decide to continue playing, that that opportunity does present itself to me. But, again, it's the future, and I can't necessarily uh, speak on that yet. Sure. So that happened, and I was still playing in England, ended up playing the season out of England. This go-around was, was much better in the sense of me kind of exploring and seeing the country. Like, I had a pretty good time um, just seeing some sights, traveling. And then that brings me into this current previous off-season. Yeah, holy fuck, um, we're finally almost at present day, man. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, we're finally almost at present day, man. It's... It was another similar situation, except this time I didn't necessarily have the best numbers to back me, but I still was holding out from a contractual standpoint. And I just didn't want to just end up going anywhere. Like, I really wanted the situation to be ideal, because now I'm getting older, so there's a lot of perspective going into the fact that, A, I know my days of playing are numbered. And B, like, I want to go somewhere where I can contribute and I can actually win something. Because we play sports, yes, because we love them. But at the same time, like, everybody wants to win. And that's really kind of the situation I want to try and end up in. And I end up getting offered a contract to come and play in Iceland. It was a second-place team. I was under the impression that, you know, we'd have a real shot to, to win, make some things happen. And... I was also slightly confused as to why they would want to bring me in because usually when you're a second place team and trending upwards, you don't make changes. Somebody but must I have gotten decided, hurt or something, right? Some yeah, that's what I was turnover. thinking, but that really kind of wasn't the case. But anyway, so I decided to come out here and that's where I am now. I've been here for a week and some change and Iceland has been an experience to say the least just because of the weather and the climate. You know, it's, it's cool. So that's... Man, that's been like seven, eight years of life right there. <laughs> that's crazy, bro. That's crazy. And we'll wrap this whole thing up here, kind of put a cherry on top with one last question or situation for you. But I guess through all of this, was there ever an NBA look or how does that go about its business? I know you keep mentioning you're back for the summer and I'm thinking summer league in my head. That's kind of an area of opportunity there. So I guess how would that process work ultimately? And then have you ever had an opportunity to go through any of it? Man, so <laughs> what's really frustrating about that question is Summer League is essentially like it's it's the key. It's it's a door opener. Like if you get an invite to Summer League, that is a notch on your resume that will take you into the stratosphere as far as like European basketball. Um, just because there's so much respect for the NBA basketball wise. My goal, like coming out of Lehigh and not being an NBA talent, like talented guy from a caliber standpoint was to crack Summer League because I knew if I could crack Summer League, I'd be able to play myself into an opportunity that could get me, you know, only God knows where. I've been close, but I haven't necessarily got that opportunity. During one off season, I want to say this was, man, like two and a half years ago, I was actually playing pickup, like with the Clippers at the Clipper facility. And I went in there and like I fried. I had a really, really good week playing with them, and I ended up like a sniff away from 
almost getting into training camp. And I found this out because one of my mentors used to be, as of last, either last year or two years ago, he was first assistant with the Knicks. Um, he used to coach for the Lakers. He was obviously under Derek Fisher, Phil Jackson. Having heard that, like, that's really part of what kept me going as a player because I knew and I know currently, like, I'm capable of playing at that level. But it's just more so about trying to trying to sneak in one of the back doors to get an opportunity than anything else. But as as I'm sure you know, like, it's, it's about more than talent. And you need a bunch of things to go right at the right time and in the right place for you to get those opportunities like that, especially as, you know, as you're like an aging guy. I mean, there's still there's still a little bit of hope for me to do so. And if the opportunity presents itself, I will be more than ready to take advantage of it and perform and perform at a high level. <laughs> I was going to say um, there are success stories out there. I mean, I know again, oh, just being absolutely. just being recent with the Sixers, I read through some of the articles. Uh, Jonathan Simmons, who they just added for Markel yes. Fultz, number one overall. So a man who played in the man, G League Jonathan went Simmons for number one. Is, his story is his story is so crazy because. Like he literally paid. He paid for his tryout. What? Like I don't paid, know that. What's going on, bro? So he paid the Austin Toros, which is the the Spurs G League affiliate. He paid to go to one of their open tryouts, and he killed. And he progressively climbed from that G League team to landing a roster spot. That's amazing. And then after he landed a roster spot, he obviously ended up getting you know getting signed. So like it's it's possible. It's just all about kind of finding the right situation, right timing. Like, there's so many things that go into it. We wish you nothing but luck here from the Too Close to Call podcast. Again, obviously, we appreciate you joining us. Like you mentioned, you're currently in Iceland, so I'm pretty sure it's the middle of the fucking night there and you don't have to do this. So, But if you want to give the listeners out there where they can find you on social media, I'm going to include it in the post. But, you know, if you want to give a quick shout-out where they can find you, ask some questions. Oh, man, feel free to uh, to give me a nice little follow uh, at Be Like Mike. With two L's, so B E L L M I K E. Uh, that's my Instagram. And then if you want to actually keep up with any of my reading, feel free to go to uh, www.closeup360.com. Closeup360.com. Yes, sir. I like again. We wish you the best of luck this summer. I know shit's crazy out there, so you may not end the or this spring even February. Christ, I don't even know what time of year it is, but hopefully things go well for you. And obviously, love to stay in touch with you here, get you on. And even if your basketball career doesn't work out, we'll have you on for your next career. Uh, that acting, obviously. <laughs> so don't forget uh, about us when you're up there accepting the Oscar. You know what I'm saying? Man, never that, bro. Never that at all. Oh, shit. So, but anyway, man, like I mentioned, we appreciate it. We'll talk to you again soon, and thanks for coming on. Uh, No problem. Thank you for having me.